Uh, did you ever feel uh, underestimated in, in Pink Floyd? Um, no, not really. No, I sort of got that impression. Do you think I was? No, I was thinking compared to Roger Waters. Well, Roger has always been a much better self-publicist than I am. Continue with Smurf. It's been four years since Pink Floyd released what many thought would be their farewell album, The Final Cut. But now a new, leaner version of Pink Floyd is back with a new album, video, and tour. With the departure of longtime songwriter Roger Waters, remaining band members Nick Mason, Richard Wright, and lead singer guitarist David Gilmore are learning to fly on their own. We are Pink Floyd, you know. Roger's left. It's a very simple matter in my in, in my mind. It's a simple matter. It's a rock and roll group. Someone's left. The others get to carry on. <laughs> left to pursue solo projects such as this summer's Radio Chaos album, and he's not happy that the group is continuing to call itself Pink Floyd. Uh, no, Roger's uh, basically brought two legal actions against us, which I don't know how long they'll take to get to court, but um, we will see. I, I don't envisage them uh, causing us too many problems. I don't think that he or anyone else has the right to tell us whether or not we can carry on and, and, and use it ourselves. Well, I, you know, if, the, if, if Ringo and George reformed and called themselves the Beatles, I personally would be extremely upset. But there are millions and millions of children out there who go, oh, the Beatles are coming to town. Wahoo! Let's go and buy tickets. Or, oh, look, a Beatles album's coming out. Well, let's go and buy it. That's all, and that's exploitation, and I think it's wrong. I've got nothing against, you know, Dave Gilmore and Nick Mason working together. And you can... Of course they wouldn't if they, didn't, if they weren't working under the name Pink Floyd because they can't stand each other. No. The inside. For clothes that twist and long. At Bold 3 Detergent Plus. United Kingdom has a new album out and fans are expected to rush for it. Francesca Capucci has the good news for Pink Floyd fans. Pink Floyd has had a four-year lapse in its career, but you wouldn't know it by looking at this week's Billboard Pop album chart. After 693 weeks, the album Dark Side of the Moon is still holding strong. That album was released 15 years ago, and many records have followed, all of which have gone platinum. Just 
Now, Pink Floyd has reached a turning point in its career. After the departure of Roger Waters, who was pursuing a solo career, Pink Floyd has released a new album entitled A Momentary Lapse of Reason. It's the first time I've heard it right now. And what do you think? It sounds great. I mean, it sounds like Pink Floyd. It's great. Welcome to episode 16 of my... 16? No wonder I'm getting burned out. Welcome to episode 16 of my Pink Floyd album, Deep Dives. Today, we're going to be talking about the first Pink Floyd album without founding member Roger Waters, A Momentary Lapse of Reason. It was released on September 7th, 1987. I said this about the final cut. I'm going to say it about A Momentary Lapse of Reason. It's not really a Pink Floyd album. Essentially, this is a David Gilmour solo album. As a matter of fact, many tracks that appeared on Momentary Lapse of Reason were actually in consideration for Dave Gilmour's third solo album, which he was planning on recording and releasing, but then decided that because his first two solo albums hadn't performed that well, he probably was better off marketing it as a Pink Floyd album. So that's exactly what he did. Now, this is no more a Pink Floyd album than the final cut was a Pink Floyd album. And it's kind of the pot calling the kettle black when David Gilmore is talking about the fact that, well, the final cut was a Roger Waters album and he didn't allow any creative input from anybody else. I mean, basically what you have here is David Gilmore's version of the final cut. It's all his songs. He picked a lot of session musicians. Rick Wright and Nick Mason are barely on here, as David Gilmore has admitted himself. So, yeah, it's got Pink Floyd on the title, but for all intents and purposes, this is really a Dave Gilmore solo album. And, fine. You want to call it a Pink Floyd album? I don't care. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we got Hypnosis album cover. I'm glad that at least it sounds a little more, a little more maybe like a Pink Floyd album, if only because you got David Gilmore singing all of the vocals. I do miss Roger Waters, I'm not going to lie. But this is what we got in 1987. You know, one of the things that I've always said, whether I'll stick to it or not, I don't know, is that I would hate to go out as a nostalgia band playing the songs we were playing 15 years ago for an audience who were with us 15 years ago you know that it's you've got to feel if, that you're going out and and breaking new ground I mean that you're reaching new audiences that people are interested in what you're doing now not in revisiting their childhood so David Gilmore invited Nick Mason and Rick Wright back to the fold. Rick Wright is not pictured on the photos uh, that were taken in publicity for this album because he was worried about litigation from Roger Waters. So he's here, but probably he's not here any more than Nick Mason is. Nick Mason's drum skills had atrophied uh, in the early 80s that's why he doesn't really drum all that much on the final cut either uh, i presume that he must have taken some kind of drumming workshop before they went on tour i don't know but all i can tell you is david gilmore says nick mason did some tom tom work on here and that's about it and it's no secret that this is not my favorite Pink Floyd album. It's not even in my top 10. It's probably going to rank somewhere. I would say if I had to slot this, it would be uh, above Amagama and under the final cut. I like final cut a little bit better than this. You can roast me in the comment section. I don't care. I'm just giving it to you straight. That's how I see it. But anyway, we're gonna talk about this album. It's it's not a bad album. I don't I'm not trying to crap on this album. I know it seems like I kinda got a crappy attitude about it, but it is what it is. We're, we're now getting to the stage where I'm starting to lose enthusiasm for some of these Pink Floyd records. I'm glad we got some new Pink Floyd product, I guess. I'm glad the final cut wasn't the way that they went out, but I happen to like Division Bell a little better. Um, so, okay, first track on the album is Signs of Life, which is an instrumental. 
that was originally going to be on a David Gilmore solo album. Uh, I guess it was just some sort of instrumental passage that he repurposed for this album. Works nicely as an intro, sort of has that shine on you crazy diamond feel a little bit where you got like the keyboard opening things up and then you got uh, Dave Gilmore kind of noodling around on the guitar. Uh, it's not nearly as effective, not anywhere near as effective as Shine On You Crazy Diamond, but that's what I think of when I hear Signs of Life. Like, it, they're, they're trying to do part one of Shine On You Crazy Diamond because that will make it sound like a Pink Floyd record. And then we go straight into the first single, which was Learning to Fly. Dave Gilmore was an avid flyer. He owned a bunch of planes, and so... Basically, this song is about his flying lessons that he took. And it's a pleasant enough Pink Floyd song. I like kind of that crazy riff, as insubstantial as it is. But Dave Gilmore's guitar playing is top notch. It's Dave Gilmore all over the song. Singing is fine. This is a song that he co-wrote with Bob Ezrin, who, by the way, produced this album. Roger Waters claims that Bob Ezrin had promised him he was going to work on his Radio Chaos album, but Bob Ezrin uh, went where the money was and um, signed up to produce a momentary lapse of reason. So it's co written with Bob Ezrin. And it's, it's probably my favorite song on the album. Then we go into The Dogs of War, which is, has no relationship to the song Dogs on Animals. Night and day difference from Animals. Uh, you've kind of got this churning. And again, I feel like with these songs he's trying to evoke memories of previous Pink Floyd songs. And on Dogs of War, that kind of grinding intro reminds me of Welcome to the Machine, and it reminds me a little bit of the beginning to Empty Spaces. I don't know if that was intentional, I don't know if it was subconscious, but this is a pale, to my ears anyway, imitation of those songs. Dogs of War is okay. I like when it finally picks up at the end. It's got a cool Dave Gilmore vocal. I don't hate the song. Dogs of War in the middle of haze. With no cause, we don't discriminate. It's alright. I'd give it, if I were grading it, I'd give it a, maybe a B minus, a C plus. Then we get into One Slip, which I actually happen to like. This song was co-written with uh, Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music. That's why I like it so much. It's got a little bit of a Roxy Music feel there. Um, so I like that song a lot, too. Probably my second favorite song on the album. Was it love? Or was it the idea of being in love? Or was it the hand of fate? And then we got On the Turning Away, which tries to be some sort of anthemic song about poverty it's almost like the the lyrics to the way it is by bruce hornsby slightly but it's sort of i guess this rousing chorus and we're all supposed to stand up and salute and whatever uh, it doesn't do a whole lot for me 
uh, to be honest with you. It, it's okay. It's not the worst Pink Floyd song there ever was, but, uh, you know, C minus, I would say, for On the Turning Away. On the Turning Away From the pale and downtrodden And the words they say which we won't understand Don't accept that what's happening It's just a case of other suffering Only you'll find that you're joining in the turning away then we flip the album over, and unfortunately, it doesn't get too much better. Uh, starts off with yet another movie, uh, which has got some snippets of uh, different movie dialogue. Where have we heard that before? Um, and whatever. It's got pounding drums. It's definitely got an 80s feeling production. He has left. He has cried. The song was co-written by Patrick Leonard. Uh, don't know who that is. Uh, but David Gilmore shares a songwriting credit on five of these songs. David Gilmore was getting some songwriting help. I think he struggled most with the lyrics. On the division bell, his wife uh, would help him write uh, some of the lyrics for his songs on that album. But here we just kind of got a grab bag of different um, songwriters who are helping Dave Gilmore out. So then we got, after yet another movie, we've got a slight instrumental, which doesn't do a whole lot for me. Then we get into A New Machine, part one which has got David Gilmore singing through a vocoder like he did on the song Dogs. Song doesn't do anything for me. I'm not sure he's trying to be experimental or what he was going for here. Doesn't really work for me. Then we've got Terminal Frost, which sounds a bit like smooth jazz. Could be on any of the smooth jazz radio stations. Pleasant enough. Want to throw a Pink Floyd instrumental on here. Great. Then we got A New Machine Part 2. Not sure why we needed two parts of this, but there we go. The reprise of um, A New Machine. And then the last song we got is Sorrow. One day, I just felt this thing coming on me, which became Sorrow. I wrote five verses one evening. They just flowed out from nowhere in one of those great serendipitous moments that uh, you recognize later as having been very valuable. Sorrow is okay. Sorrow is kind of a moody, atmospheric kind of song. It's a good David Gilmore guitar showcase. Goes on a bit long. Feels a little bit like it might have been padded just because he ran out of songs, but I don't mind it that much. On the remix, I think the remix definitely brings out the guitar. Guitar sounds a lot thicker, a lot heavier. Um, but it's a fine way to close out the album, I guess. It's no echoes, but it'll do, considering, you know, we're talking 1987. Um, so, yeah, as far as the, the remix goes, I would say this is definitely my go-to now. It takes away some of that 80s sheen, some of that 80s polish, some of the 80s dated production uh, on the original. doesn't entirely dispense with it, but I think this is a a much more enjoyable listening experience. I remember it being a surprise when we heard there was going to be a new Pink Floyd album because I think most of us thought that Pink Floyd had broken up in 1984, 1985, but they did not. So, yeah, that's Momentary Lapse of Reason. Uh, that is uh, my deep dive on here. This is my vinyl uh, copy of the album 
This is my cassette copy in which the image is reversed. This is the first copy that I had of the album. I had it on cassette first. And you got uh, some credits and stuff. Uh, I think there's some lyrics in the J card. And this is my CD copy. It's the original CD release of it. So, yeah. Momentary lapse of reason. Let me know if you're as lukewarm about this album as I am. I mean, there's no Pink Floyd album that I hate, but it just ranks pretty low for me in terms of their discography. So, anyway, thank you for watching. And, uh, you know... Maybe I'll see you around for Division Bell or Delicate Sound of Thunder. I haven't made up my mind yet what I'm going to do next. But thanks for watching.